Hello, good afternoon, welcome to the Cambridge Union. Today I really am thrilled to welcome, that we're joined by Claude Littner. Renowned for his cutthroat appearances on 15 series of BBC One's Apprentice, Claude's one of the UK's most forthright business leaders. His complex, fascinating work has taken him into many different industries and countries, encompassing retail startups, knife edge company rescue missions, the bruising rough and tumble of Premier League football, facing down French trade unions, taking on Texan oil barons in multi million dollar deals, and in the private sphere, conquering life threatening illnesses. So, Claude, thank you so much for coming. My um, pleasure, thank you. I imagine a lot of our audience are here sort of knowing you as Lord Sugar's right-hand man on The Apprentice, but obviously your career and relationship with him started long before that. So I'd love to sort of start being a bit about your sort of early career in the business world. Well, if I start with Alan Sugar, because he was quite uh, instrumental, really, um, what happened was um, I'd come back from northern France where I was chairman of a, um, a clothing textile manufacturer, and I'd done pretty well there. Um, and... I then came back to UK and I was unemployed. So I spoke to uh, a friend of mine and I said, you know, any jobs that you, you know, any jobs going? He said, yes, my brother-in-law thinks he's looking for someone. So I said, well, okay, that's great. Perhaps I can, you know, arrange an interview, perhaps you can arrange an interview. And I didn't know who the brother-in-law was. The brother-in-law turned out to be Alan Sugar. Um, so that was a, not exactly a pleasing kind of uh, situation because when you meet someone famous, you know, your eyes maybe light up. And so my eyes lit up at the sort of surprise of seeing Alan Sugar, and his eyes didn't light up at all at seeing me. Um, so the, the first interview I had, I remember it was on sort of the third floor of it. Our recollections are quite different. My recollection is the correct one. Alan's recollection is quite somewhat different. But we sat at this round table. He had my CV, which was pretty impressive, I can tell you. Um, and it, not realistic, but it was impressive. Um, and he sat there. And I sat opposite him, waiting for a question. But there was no question. All he did was he looked out of the window onto the sales floor, and um, a few minutes went by. It seemed like an age went by. And eventually I said, shall I tell you something about myself? And he said, yeah, go on then, go on then. And um, with that, I started talking about how brilliant I was and how many things I'd done and how successful I was. And throughout the whole time that I was talking, he wasn't looking at me at all. He was looking out at the sales floor. And then part way through, um, he started whistling. Now, I don't know if you've ever been to an interview where somebody in the middle of an interview starts whistling, but it's pretty disconcerting. Um, and so uh, he started whistling. I decided to stop talking because he clearly wasn't interested. And with that, he got up and walked out. And as he walked out, he said, bored. And I thought, oh, OK, all right. it's not the end of the world. I'll, I'll, I'll get another job. I don't know what I did wrong to upset him so much. Um, and then a few moments later, the sales director came running in, a bloke called Bernhard, and he said, Alan really likes you. You've got the job. <laughs> Honestly, what job? He couldn't possibly have liked me because we didn't exchange any, any words at all. Um, and I, sometimes I had another job lined up, but... For, for reasons that are unknown to me, I couldn't, I couldn't turn him down. So I had this job that I didn't know anything about. Um, but about a week later, I found myself in Paris uh, running Amstrad International, which was the sort of European wing of, of, of Amstrad. And um, it was quite a mystery, really, because, um, as I say, I'd never really engaged with the guy. Um, and a few weeks later, what I thought, or a few days later, I thought what I'll do is I'm going to be completely professional and I'm going to send him a text. No, it wasn't a text, a fax. Do you know, you know what faxes are? <laughs> send him a fax um, telling him all the things that were wrong with the company because it was in terrible trouble, terrible trouble. Amstrad was going through a period where they, they, they were very successful but they had bought some, um, some hard disks, all of which were faulty, and so loyal customers were coming back all the time saying machine doesn't work and there were lots of returns. It was a pretty terrible time. Um, so I thought I'd fax this through to Alan, telling him all the things that were wrong. And as I sort of put like the sixth page through, my phone rang. So I picked up the phone and um, it was Alan on the phone. Now, bearing in mind he'd never spoken to me before and we didn't really get off on the right foot. Um, 
this meeting, uh, or telephone call, was none, no better. He said, look, I'm not paying you all this money, and there were a few expletives, to, for you to tell me what's wrong. Just fix it, OK? And he put the phone down on me. So that's like two strikes with Alan, and it wasn't, it wasn't too good. Um, I actually did quite well at that company. Um, I, I started to change things. We started to get things much more organised. Um, and one day, I got a telephone call, Alan again. He said, I'm coming in tomorrow. Meet me at the airport. Phone. Down goes the phone. So got to the airport, and um, I saw him. He got in the car, and... Uh, we drove back to the office. As we were going on the telepheric, no, tel not telepheric, tele, whatever it's called, um, I missed the turning. Uh, I wanted to swear, but I thought, it must be professional, don't swear. So I thought I'd just say, oh, I wanted to say, oh, shit. I said, oh, sugar. And I thought, oh, no. <laughs> um, just cutting, cutting this very, very short, Alan came along, and I knew he'd be impressed. So what he did was he said, OK, um, I'm going to go and speak to all the, all the managers and find out, you know, what, what, whether they think you're any good. And um, so he picked up, my, asked one of the guys, he said, um, you any good? No, no, no. So I, I, Alan said, all right, I'm going to come back in a few minutes' time and I'm going to ask a question and they better get it right, Claude. So I got the management team together and I said, look, when he comes in, just whatever it is, you don't, you don't speak a word of English, so just whatever he says, say, we, oui, we, oui. okay? So he comes in a few minutes later, and he says, um, he's crap, isn't he? <laughs> and he said, we. Oui. And so that, that didn't go down too well. And Alan left. The following day, he phoned me up and said, you're leaving, you're leaving, you're finished, Claude, you're finished. So it's over, finished. Come back to London, and I'll see you in my office the next day. So I said, but Alan, no, I'm doing, I'm doing a really good job here. I'm doing, I'm doing really, really well. Um, anyway, I went back to London, and um, I thought I was going to get fired. Uh, and uh, Alan said to me, no, no, you're not getting fired. You've done a fantastic job in France. I want you to do exactly the same thing in Spain. Go to Madrid next week and do the same thing as you did in France in Spain. And so that was sort of, sorry, it was a very, very quick question, but not such a quick answer. Uh, but that was how my relationship with Alan started. But that wasn't even your question, was it? Um, have you got another question? <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually very interested in that. Um, how, how has it changed now? Is it, do you still have those sort of brusque chats or is it very different? I now know him. I, I, know, I know what he's going to do. I know what he's going to say. I know him inside out. So um, I've got to say that knowing him has been a privilege because I greatly admire him. Um, he's got his shortcomings as we all do apart from me um, but 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 actually he's incredibly commercial he's very very straight very honest in, in in a way that I wouldn't expect him to be so honest he's he's disarmingly honest to the point where if he's got something to say and it's not advantageous to him he'll still say it if, if, you know, if you're trying to do a deal he'll still tell the other party about something that's not quite right so I think he's um He's, he's honest to a fault, and he's incredibly commercial and very straight. So he's a straight talker. If you've got something to say, he wants to hear it. But if you just want a showboat, he's really not interested. So it's very important to know, know the individual. Um, and so I've got to know him, and, and I've also got to know his children. Um, and even though Alan had no, no formal education, really, and his children left school at a very young age, they are absolutely brilliant people. They are fantastic. I, I work very, very closely with them, with the children. They're not children, they're in their 50s. Um, but uh, they are smart, commercial, honest, straightforward. They're fantastic. So I think Alan has been very, very lucky with his children. And, and in that first meeting with Lord Sugar, what do you think he saw in you in that sort of very strange moment well, that not, made him want to yeah, give the job? Not a lot, really. Um, I, I think that actually what, ha what, he, what he did, when he said what I thought was bored is, I'm going to speak to the board. That's what he actually said, apparently. Um, but um, I don't think he saw much in me. Um, I think that what happened was I went to a French school. I went to the French Lycée in South Kensington. And the only th good thing about the French Lycée is that I ended up speaking French. So I'm bilingual. Uh, and for many, many years, um, it was completely useless, the fact that I had a French education. Um, and uh, only actually many years later, I got hired for a job in France. And the main purpose of, you know, the main reason I got the job, I suspect, was because I spoke French. Um, 
And with Alan, the reason I think that he took a shine to me was because he was going to send me to France and he knew that I spoke French. So after sort of struggling at school with that stupid French language, um, I ended up um, it, making my career because I spoke French, which is perverse, really. And then in those sort of early years at Amstrad, when you sort of didn't know Nordstrom so well, um, do you think sort of thick skin was a crucial sort of skill you used to have? Um, I, I don't think thick skin is the thing with Alan. I think you've got to be, you've just got to do the right thing. You've got to work very, very hard. You, 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 you don't want to show that you're impressing him, but you've got to impress him by the outcome, by the results. And I think that's what he's, that's, that's what he's actually like. He's, he doesn't, he's, he's not too much influenced by um, a whole range of things that normal people would be influenced by. But so long as you're honest, straightforward, hardworking and get results, you can be his friend with a bit of luck. And I asked this in part because I mentioned the sort of personalities of people on The Apprentice and it's become sort of infamous now, much to the joy of viewers, but very sort of boastful, arrogant people that come on with this sort of real confidence. And looking to America, you've got Trump's art of the deal that seems to lord that strategy. So do you think there's an advantage to that approach in business or do you think it's sort of hubris? No, I think to get on The Apprentice, you've got to distinguish yourself by being either very, very smart or completely over the top. And so a lot of the candidates who come on, it is a show after all, so a lot of candidates get on the show because they are extrovert personality or they've got something about them which will make it interesting for viewers to tune in every single week. Um, and so I think that's part of, part of the sort of attraction, if you like, is that you get characters. And if, if we didn't have characters, uh, if you had like 14 boring accountants there, nobody would tune in every week. Um, but if you've got some, you know, you've got maybe an attractive woman and a good looking guy and, you know, there's an opportunity of them sort of, you know, hooking up. <laughs> Um, that, that adds to the sort of um, spice of the, of the programme, although, of course, they're not allowed to do anything like that. Um, and, in fact, in the house that they live in, they are separated. Boys and girls are separated, and uh, there's somebody who's living there all the time to make sure there's no kind of monkey business. <laughs> didn't know that. That's fascinating. Yes, that's a bit of insight for you. So if you, if you decide to go on The Apprentice, no monkey business. <laughs> Before an application, people find out about that. Um, and, and if you yourself are looking for a business partner, what attributes are you going for? And when you're looking at such sort of young and inexperienced people, how do you spot entrepreneurial talent? Okay. It is very, very difficult. It, I mean, the thing is that um, I've made some choices where I've recruited people for a host of reasons um, and they haven't worked out. So I, I don't think that I'm a particularly good picker of people. Um, having said that, what I think I, I have managed to do is to the people who I have worked with, um, I've got the best out of them. I think that they've, um, they've warmed to me. Um, we've got a common purpose of trying to turn the company around and to make it profitable again. And I think I've given people, in the way that Alan Sugar gave me opportunities, I've given them opportunities to try and show me what they can do. And so people have been very grateful for the opportunity. And I've got loads of people, and, and in my mind, I think of the people who I've I've given a small opportunity to, or a small salary increase, or given them a, a role that they hadn't done before to test them. And when they've worked out, it's, it's been fantastic. It's been fantastic for me. And the reward, the reward that, that, that they've had from it has been absolutely exceptional. And, and you engender quite a lot of loyalty from pe giving people opportunities. But picking people from an interview is, is a very difficult thing, because you only get a, so a, sh a short period of time to judge the person they're typically nervous or um, they're kind of boastful about what they've achieved or what they've done. And so it's quite hard to, to get the right choice. Very, very hard. You start doing a 10-week process and maybe things will change. So from that... Uh, well, question, does nobody want question, no questions from anybody? I, I'm about to hand over, actually, oh, yes. Right. Um, so on that, um, I think we're about 20 minutes in, so I'm going to hand over to audience questions and, and stop monopolising okay. Claude myself. So if you could just wait for a mic to get to you before you ask your questions so we can catch you on the live stream, um, we'll do hands up. No questions. Right, so I can go home now. <laughs> Anyone? Uh, we'll go to that lady at the back. Uh, just to start. Hello, thank you for coming today. Um, I just wanted to know your opinion on what the education system and also the government are doing to support sort of what you see out there in the business world and whether that's uh, relevant and what more they could be doing to help sort of inspire young people to start businesses. Well, I think there's a lot they can do and I think there's a lot they should be doing. 
Um, I think that, and again, I, I, I may be wrong, but I think that the education system is, is kind of in the dark ages, really. I think there's so many new things that people should be training to do or, and, and getting qualifications to do. So I think that it's all very well having a, a classical education. Um, but I do think there are so many opportunities in the business world, the scientific world, in engineering. There are so many things that I think you just need to kind of a radical review of how you're providing education for, uh, for, for younger people. Because the world that they're going into, I think, is quite a different world from the one that, um, that I was in. Uh, and the skills that are required are completely different as well. Um, so I think there's a lot of skills that I think should be taught that I think the government and universities are perhaps missing out on. But you're, you're, in, it, you're in the system at the moment. You, you maybe have a, have a better view of whether the education you're getting is exactly what you want and whether it's going to make you, um, you know, employable or whether maybe that's not your objective anyway. Your objective is, is just education for education's sake. Um, hello. If there's one business advice you could give that's quite pithy, what would it be? One piece of business advice? Just very Look, quickly. Um, I, think, I think it's a shame you've asked me what's one business of, piece of business advice because there are so many things. I think that what you've got principally is you are you as an individual and I think the most important thing is that uh, you're kind of true to yourself, is that... Um, that you have an honest profile, that you're, you're, you're straight, because if you're not, I think that sooner or later you'll get found out. So I think it is important um, just to have, have the right kind of attitude to work. So you're going there, it's a kind of contract between you and the employer, for example, but it's important that you, um, that you do your utmost, because that's the way I think that you'll get the most out of it for yourself, but also the employer, hopefully, We'll see somebody who is engaging, industrious, wants to get on in life, and, and, and hopefully will give you the opportunities that, that you deserve. Um, I think so many people just, um, you know, maybe just they graduate and they think, right, well, now I can command a big salary and I don't have to do too much because I'm, I'm going to be a manager. But I do think that wherever you kind of start off is not where you end up. Uh, and I think there's nothing that beats, OK, being clever, uh, but hard work. Um, and honesty, integrity, I think, are very important. Hi, Claude. Thank you very much for coming to speak to us. Um, so, on your Wikipedia page, it says that you're a turnaround specialist. So, you take a struggling company and you, you, know, you put, set it on the right track. So, to me and maybe other people here, that seems like a deeply stressful job because you inherit a deeply flawed company a lot of the time. A lot of the mechanisms in it aren't working. What about that do you enjoy? Because you'd think that once you'd reached a certain point in your career, you'd go, do you know what, actually, I'm just going to keep going to companies which essentially want me to be the face of them and, you know, that are already going up. Well, the thing is that um, I've worked out that I'm not very good at many things, um, but I happen to be good at turning companies around. And I don't know why, I don't know how, but somehow or other... Um, when I get into a company, I'm fully energised. It's very, very stressful. It's deeply stressful. And it's very annoying because what you've got is typically you inherit a company which, um, where the best people have left because they realise the company is just about to fold. And so what you're left with is people who are kind of discouraged, not really pulling their weight, think it's all going to end. And then this strange bloke comes in and sort of wants to change the way they've been doing things forever. Um, so it's very, very difficult to kind of win people over and for them to buy into what you're trying to do. Uh, a lot of people don't want to change. So uh, they've been doing the thing a particular way, uh, particularly directors, senior managers, they, they're not going to change, they don't want to change, they resist change, um, and they think they can go elsewhere and do better anyway because they're so bright. Um, so it is a mountain you've got to climb in terms of trying to engage with the management team. All the time you're engaging with the management team, you've got the bloody banks who are owed millions of pounds, who are screaming for their money, who want to close you down, who want to do all kinds of things to you. And then you've got people who you haven't paid the bills. You haven't paid their bills for ages. You've been taking product or whatever it is, or services, you haven't paid them. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a nightmare situation. Why anyone would want to go into it is beyond me. But the point is that um, I just somehow have got a skill I've got a skill, and I've been lucky because a lot of the companies I've been to, um, I've found the management team 
even though they may not be great, they somehow rise to the occasion. So some people have got to fall by the wayside um, because they're just not going to change and they're hopeless, they're just bringing the company down. But then you just get a, a kind of a number of people, it doesn't need to be too many people, who just you can trust and who want to do well and who want to do well for the company, who want to get the company back up and running. And within a few months, somehow, the wheels start to turn. Um, you, you know, you, you, you've calmed the banks down because they can see some change. You give them management accounts that actually look like there's sort of some kind of pr promise at the end of the road. Um, and the company starts to have some momentum. Um, and so I can only explain it by saying that I find that really challenging. I find it great. That's the thing that really... I say it gets me up. I, I, I don't sleep. I mean, I, I can be up all night worrying, wondering, thinking what I'm going to do tomorrow, what I'm going to say, how I'm going to meet the challenge. Um, but I, I, just, I just really, I really, I loved it. I just really enjoyed it. And I was good at it. And, and somehow it's also, if you're good at something and you enjoy doing it and you've been successful, then the next company comes along and they say, well, can you do it for us as well? And so I got a little bit of a reputation for kind of being, being able to kind of turn companies around. But it's not, it's not for the faint-hearted. Um, I was wondering if any of the challenges you had when you were turning businesses around helped you when you had your accident and if you could use what you'd learned in that experience to help you get through that one. Um, well, when I was diagnosed with, with, with cancer, um, my, business, my business career came to a stop because um, there was no way I could carry on in business doing anything um, because I just I wasn't fit for anything to be honest with you and and uh, all, all you all your life becomes is just hospital visits hospital stays chemotherapy uh, it's just ruins ruins everything ruins every aspect of your life really so um, the only thing it does is is it kind of um, it, it, it just keeps you awake at night praying that you're going to get over this and that you can then resume your life may not be the same as it was before, but you can kind of get back to some kind of, you know, way of doing the things that you want to do. So I, I think that um, I think that's the only thing I can say is that you know I, I wouldn't want anyone to, to to experience what I experienced. It's 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 horrific, um, and certainly going through that experience and coming through the other end and surviving is something that um, stays with you really pretty much the the rest of your life, and it does change the way you think about things. <laughs> the way you treat people, um, the way you care for other people in a way that um, before then I was much more ruthless and I didn't, I didn't have any thoughts about, about people who were going through traumatic experiences. I had one experience where I was, um, I was very, very ill um, and I went to this one place in the hospital which was um, a nuclear science place and um, there were a lot of people sitting around there and I looked at them and I thought oh my God, look what they look like. They are in a terrible state, aren't they? Um, and what I didn't realise was they were probably looking at me thinking I was in the same state. Um, and I came up in the lift on one occasion and um, this guy got in the lift with me and um, I was wearing my Spurs coat and he said, um, I, I've, got, um, I've got what you've got. So I thought, how can he tell from the outside that he knows what I've got? So I said, well, what, what have you got? He said, oh, I sport Spurs. I said, oh, okay, that's it. So, um, but it's, it, it, it's, it's, it's not a pleasant time and I don't wish it on, on anybody, really. And, and as I was saying before, I think that um, the advances that are being made um, for kind of curing cancer or for the techniques and scientific things of, of, of better drugs, new drugs that aren't so har harsh on, on your body um, is, is, I think, making a very big difference. So um, I, I'm a... I'm a trustee of a cancer charity, a blood cancer charity, and they're doing fantastic work, uh, really with the, the objective of um, eradicating cancer. So um, let's hope they succeed. Hi, Claude, thank you for coming. What's your favorite moment from The Apprentice? And how do you, and second question very quickly, is how do you see The Apprentice to have changed over the last 21 seasons? And the third is what long-term connections do the winners have with you and Lord Sugar? Okay, um, look. I've got two favourite moments. Uh, the one favourite moment is the interviews because it's, it's the opportunity I have to, um, to actually engage with the, um, the final five or whatever it is um, and to really grill them on their, C on their CV and more importantly on their business plan because it's getting to the point where 
one of them is going to win. And so it's important that I make sure that the investment that Alan's going to make is with the right, with the right person. Um, so that's pretty important. The second bit best moment for me is when it ends because I, I, I can't begin to tell you how stressful doing The Apprentice actually is. Karen and I, separately I should say, get up at about 5.30 in the morning, 4.30 in the morning. Um, <laughs> just want to make that clear. Um, and, uh, you know, we make our way, okay, you know, we, we are, it is luxurious, we're, we're treated like royalty, you know, got cars on hand and all that kind of thing, but getting up at 4.30 every single morning uh, and wandering around with these candidates for, for God knows how many weeks and, and not, not actually saying a word to them, because, I mean, a lot of them come in and say, you know, they want, they want to befriend me, so they say, oh, hello, Claude, oh, we'd love your hair today, you know, or something like that, don't say that. Um, <laughs> Uh, but, you know, they, they kind of try and sort of, you know, tell me how, how wonderful I am. And I ignore them completely, completely. It's like they're not there. Because if I start engaging with them, I'm worried that um, they'll think that, I'm, that I favour them. They'll think that, oh, you know, I spoke to Claude today. Um, and, you know, they might start, like, winking at me or kind of... Um, no, but, but so I've, I've got to be completely, completely dispassionate and a absolutely ignore them completely ignore them. And similarly, when they say stupid things and do stupid things, which is most of the time, um, I can't, tempted though I am, to say, are you crazy? Um, just, just, just keep, just keep note-taking um, and let them get on with it. Let them make the mistakes, um, which is quite difficult to do because you see someone kind of, um, you know, going over a cliff, you try and stop them, but, you know, I let them go, <laughs> I let them go over the cliff. Um, so has it changed over the last 20 years? Is that sort of... Um, Well, Alan Sugar's jokes haven't changed, so that's one thing that's, that's constant. Um, I don't think too much has changed. I mean, it's almost like you've got a winning formula and a winning format. Um, you don't want to change it too much, but also, whereas a lot of people, a lot of viewers say, couldn't you have a, a more complex task? Couldn't we see a bit more of whatever? The point is the tasks have got to be done in two or three days. So there's little opportunity for changing it and making it more complex because also the viewers, they don't want anything too complicated. They want to have a, enjoy, the, enjoy it for, for you know, whatever sort of turns them on, whether it's you know, candidates behaving badly or Alan Sugar um, being tough or Karen being horrible. Um, no, I, I just think that, that it's a format that, that has been successful and so it's, it's, there isn't much opportunity for changing it. I think also the candidates have changed over the years because... Um, and this is just my impression, is that we used to get better candidates. And that's not to say there aren't some very good candidates, but they were, there seemed to be a more, more of them who were good right from the off. Whereas here, when you get down to the last five, you then see there are two or three who are pretty good. Um, but what I want is I'd like to see 10 or 12 who are good. Um, and so I think that's something that is a little bit disappointing. Also what's disappointing from my point of view, and I'm in da dangerous ground here, is the girls are so much cleverer than the blokes. I mean, I don't know why that is, but, yeah. <laughs> but, but seriously, year after year, it, the, 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 the girls' teams seem to do better, and I don't know why that is. I, you know, this year I'm hoping that there's going to be a, a, a male kind of winner, um, but, um, but I just think that it just, we want better candidates. I want better candidates. And you, you, know, you see the 15 or however many kind of turn up at the first uh, boardroom, and um, it's a bit disappointing. You know, you, you'd want, you, you don't want, what, what seems to happen is you've got people who are outrageous, more and more outrageous, and more, more and more like crazy characters, rather than more and more serious business people. Um, and so, you know, it's easy to get rid of the first kind of 10 people because they're never going to be investable uh, with Alan, never. Hi, uh, thanks for coming. Um, so I have a seven-month-old uh, yep. business. I yeah, that. yeah. And I struggle to find the balance between chasing invoices and being a bit aggressive and then being like a really empathetic, nice, kind educator. And I was wondering, you know, you were saying how sugar and sugar is like really honest and stuff. How much of your authentic self do you bring into a business situation? Like, because obviously with your friends at the pub, you're a bit different from when you're pitching to investors, right? So how do you, how do you strike the balance between being yourself but also being quite, you know, business savvy and that kind of stuff? Well, look, if you're starting a business, a seven-month business, you're in survival mode unless you happen to have taken off from day one. So I think you've got to be, you've got to be tough and I think you've got to be straight with 
people who owe you money and say, look, I'm a small business, I, I need you to pay me. You know, you've exceeded the terms, I can't carry on in business unless you pay me. So I think it's a matter of having not a, a rude conversation, but a straightforward conversation with people who are holding you back. Because if they don't pay you, you can't then buy the next lot of stock or whatever it happens to be. Um, so I think the approach is one that you, 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 you've got to be respectful, but you've got to be insistent. Um, and I think that's the trouble with a lot of very big companies is that um, uh, they, they're, not, they're not careful enough with their suppliers. So you've got very large companies, they've got small suppliers, and they, they, they let the suppliers you know, wait 90 days before they get their money or longer. And that can actually ruin a small company who are desperate for cash flow. Um, so, you know, my, my advice will always be to kind of be straight and be honest, but get your money, because you can't afford not to have your money, um, because you, if you do, you, you may very well go under, or you start overtrading, which means that, um, you know, you then can't pay your bills. Um, so I, I, I think it's just, it, it's tough. Start, starting a new business is very, very tough. Um, I mean, I, I encourage people to start a business, but they've got to understand, and I've started a number, that... Um, it, it's, it's not for everyone, and it's, it's, it is tough. But if you make it, if you can be successful, then it's, there's, nothing, there's nothing like having a business that you've created, that you've developed, and that maybe you can go on to sell or float. Thank you very much for coming. Um, you were CEO of Tottenham Hotspur for like five years in the 90s. Are Tottenham ever going to win a trophy? <sighs> it's becoming more and more difficult because what you've got is you've got Manchester City who have got loads and loads of money and also appear to have um, the ability to attract the best players. You've got Liverpool, who are absolutely fantastic. Um, you've got Chelsea, also loads of money, big, big backing. Um, and so that takes care of three places. And typically, um, and I hate to mention the fourth one um, for obvious reasons. Um, so it's, become, it's becoming more and it's becoming tougher and tougher. And, and also, I think that, I mean, thinking about Spurs, um, it's deeply disappointing because we've spent a lot of money on players, but what we've actually got are players who are not very good. And so it is, <laughs> um, no, it really is. It, it, it's, it's hurtful when you, you, when you see players who either don't want to be with, play for Tottenham. Um, are you a Tottenham fan? Oh, good. I saw you've got a happy face. I can see you're not troubled. Um, um, but it, it's, it's difficult. We've paid a lot of money for a player and he's come there and he doesn't, he doesn't want to play for Spurs. You know, oh, there's, there's not a lot you can do. I mean, they, they, they've got huge contracts, these players. Um, inevitably, if they don't fit in, you've got to get rid of them. You're going to make a loss on them. Uh, and it's disruptive for the rest of the team. So when you get a settled team, when you've got some good players who got, you know, got a, a, a will to play for that club, then I think you've got a formula that could be successful. And with Spurs, I, I'm, I'm hopeful, but I'm not very optimistic that they're going to do anything special. Having said that, we have got a good manager. And if, in fact, um, Daniel Levy is prepared to um, open the checkbook and we get some really good players, then we do have a chance. We do have a chance because we've got a lot going for us. But um, unfortunately, we've got these teams, these clubs in, ahead of us who are just so resourceful, it's just ridiculous. And they're miles ahead of us. Hi, Claude. Thank Hi. you for coming. I know it's early, but do you have any potential favourites that you're backing for The Apprentice this year? I, I, honestly, well, first of all, I'm not, I'm not in The Apprentice this year, OK? Um, uh, and the thing about favourites is that uh, what happens is that you see somebody who, like, in week one and week two, looks impressive. And... Um, you think, oh, they, they, seem, they seem quite good. They, you know, they, they look all right. Um, and then by week four, they failed. You, know, you can see that you know, they had one good week and then they, they haven't succeeded. So the favourites, you don't really have favourites because you, you go with the flow. Um, but, but it's very hard to pick a favourite because different tasks, different people, different situations, you can see the people who are useless. They're very, very easy to spot. Uh, there are plenty of them as well. Um, but, but it's hard to actually pick in the early stages those who are going to come through because sometimes you get somebody who's a bit slow, a bit quiet, a bit shy, uh, a bit reticent at the beginning, but actually after a few weeks they come into their own um, or they have a task where suddenly it's a task that they really are alive to it and they do really well and suddenly you think, oh, that, that, that person showed me something I didn't expect. So, um, so I can't talk about this year, um, but... Uh, 
but I think every year there's some there's somebody who a candidate who kind of just after a few weeks or suddenly they kind of emerge as potential winners. Hi Claude, uh, thanks for coming to speak to us. Uh, I had two questions. The first one was what's but in your business career, what's been the biggest learning experience for you? And secondly, I know you said that usually people emerge after a bit of time, but has it happened where you and Karen in a season have kind of spotted someone from day one and then they have ended up winning? Or does that just not really happen? Okay, so um, what was the first question? Learning experience. Learning experience. Look, the way I look at things, um, every single encounter I have is a learning experience. I'm not just saying that, but... Um, you meet somebody and they say something and it sticks in your mind and it's a kind of learning experience. So I think that, that, that every business I've been in, um, even though I'm like the boss, uh, I've learned a lot from, from, from lots of people around me and lots of people who have kind of come up with good ideas and they've changed my view of how, the next, you know, how we should sort of map out the next stage of the development of the company. And so it doesn't, it doesn't have to be somebody who's high up in the business, but somebody who, who just is using their head, using their brain, and comes up with a good idea. And that, that's what you want. You want, if I'm the only one who's thinking in the business, we're not going to get anywhere. But if I can kind of get lots of people thinking, lots of people coming up with ideas, um, that's, that's a very stimulating environment. But also it does lead to success. It really does. So... And I'm telling you, honestly, I, I, I speak to people. I was speaking to somebody just yesterday, for example. They just said something to me, and it sort of inspired me. I thought, that, that's very, very interesting. It's very interesting. The way people handle situations, the way, the way people, um, you know, bad things happen, or, or, or you hear about sort of, um, you know, some serial illnesses, for example, and the way those people, for example, cope with, with, with illness or cope with success. Um, it's just, it's very inspiring to understand how different people react. And, and even though I, I've got a particular mindset, um, when you meet somebody who has got a completely different mindset, it's very interesting to hear why they've, why they've chosen that path. So for me, I, I just find I'm, um, I'm listening and engaging with everybody all the time. And I, I, the most un, unlikely characters somehow if not inspire me, I just I listen to them and I learn from them. So I think this learning thing is, um, is, is very, very important, really important. I can't remember what your second question was, of course. Um, has that ever happened from day one? You and Karen have spotted someone and oh, they've ended up winning. Well, we, we might spot someone from day one, but it's, it's kind of meaningless, really, because uh, in day two, we've got a different opinion of that person. And, and also, I, I think that we're not trying to form an opinion too early. It's, it, it, the way that it works, really, is that... Um, we just advise Alan constantly, and he's, 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 he's relentless in this. So we're, we're on a task, um, and um, after about two hours, um, Alan expects us to write a note to him, send him, a, send him a text, send him an email of what's going on. So he wants to be involved in everything that's going on, which is very, very tiresome because you've got to stop the filming so that you can actually write a note to Alan about what's actually happened. And very often nothing's happened, but you've got to, you know, he, does, he won't accept that nothing's happened because two hours have passed and he wants to know what's happened. So we kind of, you know, invent certain things as what's happened or we imagine what possibly was going on in somebody's mind um, just to kind of, you know, then, then off, off our backs and, and get on with it. But the truth is he, he is very, very involved in everything. Um, and the fact that we might have somebody who has shown promise in week one um, is, is not a reason to get too excited. And we wouldn't have to say to him, uh, keep your eye on, num you know, on number three, because um, it, it's just irrelevant. It's, 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 it's a process and it unwinds and unravels and you see people reacting in a particular way when they get sent back to the boardroom or where um, you know, they get back in the house and they're all cheerful about various things. You, you, you pick up bits of their character and that's why when you get to sort of week eight, nine, 10, 11, you really have got a much better picture of who's emerging as somebody who could be investable and who Alan would get on with and who's got a business, a business plan that's worthy. And in fact, the business plans, I only get to see the business plan about four or five days before the interviews. So, you know, people have often said, well, why don't you get to see the business plan week one? Well, that kind of destroys it because the whole idea of it is that they do the tasks, we, we assess them, we see what their character's like, and it's only towards the end when we really think, right, we've got someone who's a potential winner that we see the business plan and get an opportunity of challenging them on it. Thank you for coming. 
Um, out of all of the Apprentice winners, who do you think has gone on to be the most successful or made the most out of Lord Sugar's investment? Um, he's had a lot of winners who have gone on to be successful. There are a number of winners who are fantastic. Ricky Martin, for example. Um, I interviewed Ricky Martin. The moment I, the moment I interviewed him, I, I, I saw someone who was clever. I saw someone brilliant. I just, I just thought he was great. And there are a number of other candidates who just somehow, they've, they've just inspired me at the interview um, or during the process where I've just seen something exceptional about them. Now, not all, not all of them have gone on to do so uh, do well, um, even though some of them have been very impressive, uh, but most of the um, winners have gone on to do either very, very well or they've got businesses which are thriving. So um, he, he, he's, he's, he's an unusual character, Alan, because you think he's not paying attention, but actually he is paying attention. He's got a funny way of looking at you but not looking at you. And um, only because I know him so well, I can see when he's not looking at you that he's really looking at you and he's really paying attention. You think he's given up, he's not, but he's got this particular skill of um, just seeing something in somebody and capitalising on it. Thank you. Um, just a quick question about football as a business. You entered the football world as a chief exec and I was just wondering if, how you found the football business to be different from any other business that you've been involved in and yep. how football, the football business has changed since you've left and how unrecognisable or recognisable it is from the time that you were there. Okay. The football business is awful. I say it's awful because it is, um, it, it's a very difficult business because you're dealing in human capital. Um, and uh, you're also dealing with people who think that if you haven't been brought up in the football world, you don't know anything. Um, so you've got this terrible situation where the fans can immediately spot a player who's not giving his best or just isn't very good. Um, but you've then got the people who have chosen that player, the scouts, for example, um, who have like said, you know, this is the player we've got to buy, and the directors who don't know any better um, listen to what the manager's got to say and what the scouts have got to say and dish out all this money on a contract for a player who doesn't really want to play for you, um, just wants to collect his money, um, and... Um, is going to be a very big disappointment. So it's a big disappointment for the fans, a big disappointment and a terrible investment for the directors. Uh, the manager doesn't get any satisfaction because the player's not playing well. Um, and it just, it just works very, very badly. Also, when I, when I became involved with Spurs, um, fraud was a big thing, a very big thing. So what would happen is we'd get 35,000 people coming to the game and uh, uh, on the Monday... Um, when I looked at the cash receipts, for example, we got, we got 20,000 people who paid. And so we could never understand where 15,000 people, wh where that money went. And it went to lots of people who were just, just stealing from Spurs. Um, you know, whether the, 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 the people who ran the turnstiles, whether the people who came for corporate hospitality and didn't pay, it was just, it was a paradise for people who just wanted freebies. Um, and um, I just tried to put a stop to it, uh, which made me incredibly unpopular. Uh, so for example, there was one company who, um, they had a box and the box was supposed to be 40,000 pounds at that time. And they, they hadn't paid, they hadn't paid for 20 years. So they'd been using the box for 20 years, never paid. So I spoke to Mike, who was like the commercial manager, I said, well, why, why haven't these people paid? 40,000 pounds, they, they, they owe us 400,000 um, pounds. He said, no, 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 they don't pay. I said, no, I know they don't pay, that's the problem, <laughs> they don't pay. So he said, no, no, because they did, they did a favour for Spurs about 20 years ago, and they were told that they didn't have to pay. So I said, right, they've got to pay. From now on, they've got to pay. There's no, there's no, no one comes in free of charge. And so... Um, we had, you know, Manchester United was the next home game. I said, do not let them in. They can't, unless they pay, they're not, they're, they're not coming in. Anyway, sure enough, they did pay. You just had to ask them and tell them to pay. But they, they were getting away with murder. And um, the next season, I stopped all the, all the, all the cash till, the turnstiles, stopped them all. If they, somebody wanted a ticket, it had to be all ticket match. So that, again, we started to get things moving in the right direction. And other clubs took our lead and saw that, 
you know, they were also they were also subject to the same scandal, if you like. Um, and so we kind of professionalised things. Um, but I mean, the, the problem about about football is that um, you, you put all this money out um, in the hope that the player is going to kind of do things for you, and a lot of them are very disappointing. They just they. They're just there for the money. They, they're just, or they're not good enough players. We've made the wrong choice. So it's, it's a difficult business. It's got even worse, I think, over the, over the years because now the sums of money are absolutely astronomical. When you think of players earning like millions, um, it just, it, it's just almost an embarrassment, really. And the clubs who have got the deepest pockets tend to have the, the best players because players go where the money is. Um, so I think it's, it's still a very... It's, a, it's, a, it's not a nice business. I mean, it's a wonderful spectator sport, fabulous. And for example, Spurs and many other clubs, they, what, what they've done to their stadium is just miraculous. It's wonderful. Um, but I still think it's, a, it's, a, it's not, the, you know, the underside of football is, is pretty, pretty depressing, really. Thanks for coming to speak to us today. Uh, just based on what you were saying about football and players there, you were talking about how you interview potential business people, people to work for you. Might there be some lessons that football can take from the business world in how it interviews players and, like you say, finds players that actually want to play for the football club that you've just signed them for? I'd love to say yes, but the football fraternity only believe that they have, they have insight into a football player. You know, you've got somebody like... Um, oh, I've, got, I've forgotten his name. But he's, he's got an encyclopedic knowledge about players. Any player you ask about, he knows about. Um, but most of these scouts, I don't know whether they kind of get commissioned for finding players or what the deal is, um, but it, it, it is hard to select a player. Also, what you have is you have people, you have players who come to Spurs, for example, when they're kids, 9, 10, 11 year olds, and you watch them year after year and they become 16, 17 year olds. And um, in, in Holland, for example, what you do with these young players is you give them a bit of education. So, for example, Ajax, in the morning they have proper class where they have, you know, they learn about life and about business and about, you know, everything apart from football. In the afternoon, they, 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 they do their football skills. In the UK, we spoil kids. We keep, keep them on a hook until they're 17 when they've got to sign professional contracts. And then, after having been with us all these years, we decide they're not good enough and we throw them away. So in a way, we're not, we're not looking after these footballers either. We treat them as, as people who can only do you one thing, you know, play football, as, as opposed to trying to um, give them some life skills so that when they finish with football, they've actually got a career to go to. And very, very few players, certainly in the era that I was there, went on to actually do anything other than, you know, live on their money or I don't know what they did, but they, they didn't ever go into any kind of profession or have any skill afterwards. And I think that's a real shame. Um, so um, it, it's football's fault because we create people who, who we've, who've got no other skill other than the ability to play football and we treat them just as human capital. You're not good enough. We've, you know, you've been playing with us for 17 years or 12 years. We don't want you anymore. Goodbye. And that's it. And they're devastated, these kids, because they were looking forward to a career in football, playing for Spurs or, you know, top division club, and they're just thrown on, you know, just discarded. So it's no wonder that at the other end of the spectrum that um, if players don't want to play for you, they don't bother either. Um, I just wondered, in your opinion, what is actually the best tactic if you're in the final three in the boardroom? Should you stay silent? Should you gang up with your other pal on the third one? Etc. <laughs> Um, is that because you're applying next year? Is that you want to oh, yeah. insight? Yeah. You um, I don't. I don't know whether any tactics work. To be honest with you, um, you know, you've got some people who are kind of outrageous at week one, um, and um, uh, they get away with it. Um, and some of them just kind of, you know, Alan Sugar spots them and doesn't like them because they've been too outrageous or too outspoken, or they they claim that they've, that, you know, the task was won by their ingenuity, whereas really it hasn't been. Um, and so there's lots of things that rub him up the wrong way. Um, and so I don't think there's any one particular tactic. But I think in The Apprentice, kind of, I say as in life, but the best candidates do come through. So those who are all sort of full of bravado, they do fail. And the ones who actually have got something about them do actually make it through. Uh, and I think it's just like, like the way it works. 
Hi, Claude. Thank you very much for coming. Um, I have a question about mentorship, really, um, about your experiences. We talked a lot about Alan Sugar's experiences, but I just wondered, have you directly mentored anybody? And a bit of a self-loaded question. Um, I have a company, and would you be open to the possibility of being my mentor? <coughs> Well, thank you for considering me. Uh, I, don't think, I don't think I'd like to take you up on the offer, though, and it's nothing personal. Um, I, I'm, I'm enjoying my life exactly as it is. Um, I'm involved with a number of companies which are uh, growth companies or companies where um, you know, they're doing second round funding, things like that. Um, and so I've, I've invested money um, in the hope that they're going to kind of make a return. Um, I'm involved with the university um, business school, which bears my name. Um, I've got lots of other kind of investments where um, I'm, I'm personally involved um, and I kind of look after those companies. And I enjoy the, the charity work that I do where I'm involved with a couple of charities. Um, and really, I don't want to do any more. Um, I, I could do more, but I don't want to. I'm, I'm at an age now, at a stage in life, where um, I do want to take it easier. I do want to enjoy my life. I want to go on holidays. I want freedom. Um, I'm, in, I'm involved with Alan, and I, I think I always will be. Um, but um, aside from that, I'm, I think I'm, I'm full with what I've got on my plate. And it's not because there aren't great opportunities, um, but I think, I'm, I think my moment has passed, to be honest with you. And um, I just want to kind of get on with my life and do the things that, that I want to do. But thank you. <laughs> Cheap shot. Hi, uh, thank you very much for coming. Um, how do you think your time on The Apprentice has affected your business career? Um, well, uh, I don't think it's affected it at all, really. Um, I, I, think I, I think I enjoy being recognised, um, so it's quite sort of nice for my ego. Um, like even when I got lost on my way here, um, I stopped to ask somebody for directions, and he said, you're from The Apprentice, aren't you? You're from The Apprentice. And I just wanted to have directions, I didn't really want to engage with him, but all he wanted to say is, you're on The Apprentice, and he was so excited about that. Um, and so I think that I, I, quite, like, I quite like that recognition. Um, as far as what it's done for my business, um, I, I don't think anything, to be honest with you. Um, I'm not sure it's been a help, I'm not sure it's been a hindrance. And um, I, I quite enjoy being, I quite enjoy being not famous, but I just quite enjoy being recognised. I don't know, it's, 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 it's something that I didn't think I'd like, but, um, but I quite enjoy it. I get, a, you know, I get quite a nice feeling when people come up to me and say, oh, hello, Claude. You know, and, and funnily enough, even though my character on, on The Apprentice is pretty revolting, people seem to be very friendly and don't seem to, don't seem to have taken account of how horrible I am. Where and why do you think most businesses fail or struggle? Okay. Well, um, there, are, there are lots and lots of reasons. I mean, the thing is that uh, if you've got a bad product, um, if you're overpriced, if you're not giving customer service, all those things are going to lead you down a path of um, probably not, not being very fruitful. Um, then companies sometimes just get too big. So you've got a company that's maybe grown from, you know, small, small company, it's grown very big, but the management aren't up to the, aren't up to, up to the, up to the standard. They just, they could deal with it when it was a small business. They don't know how to deal with it when it's a big business. And there's a difference between small businesses and, and, and larger businesses in, in the way that you manage them, in the way that you promote people, that you manage people, it's, it's quite different. So I can see that's a reason why businesses fail and things sometimes go out of fashion you know, um, you know I mean this tie I'm wearing is probably 20 years old um, it may have gone out of fashion but if you're still peddling the same thing you were many years ago and the, the market has moved and you haven't moved with the market or you haven't been ahead of the market uh, you've got every chance of failing so I think there's so many reasons um, staffing is very very important you need to have good people around you people who want to work with you people who share your vision those are really important things and, and if you haven't got those things, that's another sort of, another problem. Unions, I mean, this is going back sort of 20 years, but unions were 
a real problem. When I worked in France, um, the, the product that they produced was good, um, but there were always industrial strikes in, in France. Every week, the, you know, the unions decided to go on strike um, for, I don't know, better work, better conditions. I don't blame them, but it was very disruptive when you had a product that you promised the customer you'd have next week, uh, and they're on strike, so you couldn't deliver. So lots of things go to make um, what could be a viable company one that actually fails. Thank you, Claude. Um, so as everyone knows, we all have the same 24 hours. So <laughs> I, I just wanted to ask, um, in terms of work ethic and, and hard work, um, how crucial is that in, in becoming a success story and becoming a millionaire? Or are there underlying factors and privilege that comes into play? OK. But I've always been a ridiculously hard worker. And I think the, I think the underlying reason is because... Um, uh, I wasn't good at school, and I'm making up for the fact that, um, you know, I've got to work extra hard because I'm not that clever, so I've got to kind of compensate. And, and I, I've, I've thought that all the way through my life, is that um, I've got to work twice as hard because I'm only half as clever. Um, so I think that hard work is just, it's, 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 a good, it's a good business practice. If I look at Alan Sugar, for example, he works very, very hard, but he doesn't ever work at the weekends, ever, ever. His weekends are completely sacred. Um, so I think that there are lots of ways in which you can be successful without killing yourself. Um, and um, I just think it depends on your makeup. If you're the kind of person who just, you know, you, you want to work hard, you enjoy working hard, it gives you pleasure, and also you think you're making progress doing it, then that's fine. But lots of people have just, um, just got just very, very clever, come up with some clever ideas, and don't have to work that hard, maybe. To, to find their, their route to success. The other thing I wanted to say is that success isn't everything. It, it, depends, it depends how you measure success. Um, I've been very, very fortunate and I've overachieved. Um, and a lot of people don't care about that because money isn't, isn't the root of everything. It doesn't matter. Um, you know, I think to, to have good work ethic, to have good family life, to enjoy life, um, to be resourceful, um, to honour your parents. I mean, it's just a whole load of things that I think are really important. Um, and money is not, is not really it. It, it. it really isn't. You get to a point where how much more can you have? How much more do you need? It doesn't, it, it's nonsense. It's nonsense. It's a waste of time. Um, so, I mean, you're all clever people and you're all going to do really well, have great careers, and, and you can be proud of that. Um, but there are other things apart from just money. Um, it, it, it's, it's not everything. Claude, I really can't thank you enough for coming to speak just to the union. It's been amazing. Thanks for answering all the questions. I oh, hope that pleasure. everyone will join me in thanking Claude so much for this event. Thank you. Thank you for being so welcoming. Thanks for all your questions. Really liked it, thanks.